welcome as we continue our journey through the Word of God. Today we're going through uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to be looking at verses 3 to 6 today. And in this section, Paul is going to continue to defend his apostolic authority. What does that mean? He's an apost apostle, him being an apostle and the authority that goes along with that. And this was very important to Paul, his, his sense of apostolic authority, not because he wanted to puff himself up with position, but because he knew that he was given that apostolic anointing by Jesus to be somebody who would lead and point the churches. And the church in Corinth wasn't respecting him with that apostolic credential. And he knew that if they were going to understand who he was, that would enable them to listen to what he was going to say. Now, unfortunately, today, the idea of somebody being an apostle and the authority that goes along with that doesn't mean a lot. And, and I think there's a few reasons for that. One, because there's not enough teaching on what an apostle is. And uh, th so that people don't understand, well, what, what is an apostle? And then also, it, you know, uh, so many people call themselves apostles uh, to puff themselves up or as a title. And, they, and it's cheapened what, what it actually means, I think. And I think that's sad. Uh, but it actually does mean something. It is biblical and there is a role of an apostle. Uh, it is part of the, the, the ministries that uh, the church was given, apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists, in order for the church to be run with order. So there you go. So let's start off in verse 3. Paul here is going to be asking a lot of rhetorical questions of the church in Corinth. And he's going to be asking them and answering them, and then he's going to be making statements. And in this one, this opening verse here, uh, verse 3, he's really asking them, so am I a, a minister and an apostle according to the flesh? Is that what you think about me? So let's, let's move into it. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Paul was very happy to say, yeah, I walk in the flesh because we all do. I'm, I'm a human being and I have the same fleshly struggles that you have. But when I'm in battle, I'm not warring according to the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So he used weapons that were spiritual, not material weapons. They were uh, appropriate for spiritual warfare. And Guzik says this, the carnal weapons that Paul refers to, or refuses, sorry, were not material weapons such as swords or spears. The carnal weapons he renounced were the manipulative and deceitful ways his opponents used. Paul would not defend his apostolic credentials with carnal weapons that others used. Now, in Ephesians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul lists out what the spiritual weapons are. Uh, and there's one offensive weapon, which is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and the rest are defensive. Uh, the belt of truth, breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and of course the sword of the spirit to fight and pierce. And in order to rely on these weapons, you had to have faith in God. You couldn't have faith in just carnal, worldly, earthly methods of warfare. But they were mighty in God for pulling down spiritual strongholds, which needed to be pulled down. Now, uh, Guzik has a great list here. The Corinthian Christians tended to rely on and admire carnal weapons for the Christian battle. Instead of the belt of truth, they fought with manipulation. Instead of the breastplate of righteousness, they fought with the image of success. Instead of the shoes of gospel, they fought with smooth words. Instead of the shield of faith, they fought with the perception of power. Instead of the helmet of salvation, they fought with lording over authority. And instead of the sword of the spirit, they fought with human schemes and programs. Now, Jesus himself showed us that we must rely on spiritual weapons. In Philippians chapter 2, 6, six to 8, uh, says this about Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, 
but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So Jesus was able to be victorious through different means than other people thought he should have been. That actually was an offensive concept to the church in Corinth, the Corinthian Christians, because it seemed to be weak. How can you win when you're weak? And the, the, the human mind, the carnal way of thinking, is to overpower, dominate, manipulate, uh, be smarter than somebody. But Jesus says, no, you have to humble yourself. You have to die to yourself, and you let, have to let the resurrection power of Jesus Christ be shown through you. Redpath says, apart from a mighty awakening and revival in the church, we are fighting a losing battle because we are resisting on carnal levels. Our spiritual weapons that we have, they're just laughed at by the world. They are. They're scorned. But let me tell you, the devil and demons are scared stiff of them. And when we fight with true spiritual weapons, then no principality or power can stand against us. And that's what we have to do, pull down strongholds. Strongholds, uh, in, the, in this context here, the, the Apostle Paul talks about are wrong thoughts, wrong perceptions. Uh, things that contradict the true nature of God, the true knowledge of God. Those strongholds are expressed in arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Guzik says this, the reliance on carnal methods and the habit of carnal thinking is a true stronghold. It stubbornly sets down deep roots in the heart and mind, and it colors all of our actions and thinking. It is hard to let go of the thinking that values the things and ways of this world, but God's power really can break down these strongholds. And that's where we just have to say, thank you, Jesus, that strongholds can actually be broken and pulled down. Now, what arguments was the Apostle Paul talking about when he said arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God? The, the carnal and worldly ways of thinking, um, they are actually arguments against how God thinks and against God's methods. They, those arguments wanted to debate God, um, trying to convince God that they have a better way, convince us that they have a better way than God. And what do they do? They exalt themselves above and against the knowledge of God. They think, they think they're smarter. They think that they're more sophisticated, more effective, more powerful than God's ways. Worldly people, people who think in the world without Jesus Christ, they think they know more than everybody else and they think they know more than God does. And that's why they start to become little G-gods. We see them in society today, but it's not just today. They, they've been, we've had powerful people through human history. They've always fallen into the same trap. They believe they're smarter, better than everybody else. And if the world would just do what they said, then everything would be fine. And why do you waste your time with Christianity? Guzik said this again. We must remind ourselves that Paul speaks to the carnal, worldly thinking who are actually Christians. He isn't talking about the world here. He's actually talking about Corinthian Christians. They were the ones with the strongholds in their minds and hearts. They made the arguments against God's mind and methods. They held on to every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We miss it entirely if we think the love of manipulation, the image of success, smooth words, the perception of power, lording over authority, and human schemes and programs are just problems among unbelievers. Paul dealt with this heart and mind in the church. And I love this point because those things are very representative of people who don't have Christ. But unfortunately, a lot of people become Christians and they don't let those things go. They don't die to themselves, like the Apostle Paul said that we needed to do. So they bring them into their Christian life. They bring them into their Christian existence and experience. And, and that's, what they, that's how they think they need to operate. But Paul says, no, you've got to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. When you, uh, the way that you think when you become a Christian, you bring that that thinking, well, now you've got to submit it to the obedience of Christ. To battle against the carnal way of thinking and doing, our thoughts have to be brought captive and made obedient to Jesus. And when we start to think in that carnal way, you have to stop yourself. 
You have to take dominion over those thoughts. Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The renewing of your mind is a continuous process that happens. As long as you are breathing Christians, your, your mind is being renewed. And Paul's very first application to the church in Corinth was towards the carnal worldly thinking of the Christians. Let, let, forget about the non-Christians in Corinth. He wanted the Christians in Corinth to stop thinking carnal ways, uh, you know, using carnal ways. Because those carnal ways of thinking is what caused them to despise Paul and his apostolic credentials. And they used to see him as weak. But Paul's principle actually applies not just to the church in Corinth, not just to the unsaved in Corinth, it applies to every part of our lives. We are never helpless victims of our own thoughts. You can choose to stop your own thoughts at any time, bring those thoughts into captivity to the obedience of, uh, obedience of Christ. Uh, no matter what those thoughts are, lust, anger, fear, greed, uh, bitterness, e evil, they are part of every thought that has to be brought captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Um, so, uh, some more quotes from Guzik, and he just has so much gold on this, so that's why I'm quoting him a lot. Uh, on this particular topic here. Someone might object, I don't want my thoughts to be captive to anyone. I don't want my thoughts to be captive to Jesus. I want my thoughts to be free. This is wrong on at least two points. First, you do belong to someone. And ultimately, we either serve Jesus or Satan. Second, if you are a Christian, you are a purchased possession of Jesus Christ. You belong to him. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20 says this, or do you not know that your body is the temple of Holy Spirit who, who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you are bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. God purchased you and me, paid the ransom for you and for me through Jesus Christ on the cross. And so we must be ready to punish all disobedience, which is what Paul said he was going to do to the church in Corinth. He was ready to confront them, pull down the strongholds. And if they wouldn't do it themselves, he was going to do it. And that's the same for us. If we're not going to do it, the word of God is going to do it for you and for me. We just have to choose. He says, listen, when your obedience is fulfilled, that, that's, that's when I'm going to come. That's when I'm going to come and, and confront you. Paul sees no point in coming to confront the disobedience of the church in Corinth until they'd actually obeyed Jesus and have made up their mind to bring all those thoughts into captive subject to him. So he wants to send the letter and then give them time to digest it and to stop using the carnal way of thinking that they had done. And then he's going to come and punish any disobedience of those who have not renounced or have not stopped doing it. So he, he's, he's kind of making a threat here. I'm telling you in the letter, I'm going to give you time to digest it, then I'm going to come and turn up in person. When I turn up in person, I'm going to actually punish those who are disobedient. You might think that's really harsh, but the Apostle Paul knew that he was setting up the church, the capital C church, that was going to be in place until Jesus came back. And it had to be established on Christ in order for it to be the bride of Christ, in order for it to operate as the body of Christ. Paul knew that. And that's why he was like, okay, now I've got to do something about this. I have to make sure that this wonderful body understands the way of thinking that it must come into uh, alignment with. And the only way you can come into alignment with the things of God and thinking like God and thinking like Jesus is to come into submission. Submission under the mission. Come under the mission of Jesus Christ. Submit your thoughts, take them captive, and think differently. So, observations today. Lots in this. Um, I think a lot of Christians are, are challenged by this way of thinking because they, they don't know how to lay down the carnal thoughts, the way of thinking from before they were a Christ follower. And that can be a struggle, but you've got to take the thoughts captive. So, what, what's hard for that, uh, for you in that? Maybe there's a struggle that you've had. Maybe you've found a way to overcome it. Uh, maybe you've got some tips. Put it down in the comments below and let's share and encourage each other. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word. Allow us, Lord, to uh, bring every thought into captivity 
And thank you, Lord, that strongholds can be pulled down. They do not need to reign supreme. And that we would understand as the church that we need to use the spiritual weapons that we have at our disposal. In Jesus' name, amen.